In 2019, when private equity firm Cornell Capital bought Instant Brands, the combined company was valued at more than $2 billion. In June 2023, Instant Brands filed for bankruptcy and claimed just $500 million in assets and liabilities, a 75% decrease in value in just four years. I remember when the Instant Pot first hit the market. My mother was very conscious about health and obviously food played a big part of that. She worked full time but was also responsible for dinner every night, so the Instant Pot quickly became a staple in our home. I even bought my own when I moved out and got my first apartment after college. Since its debut in 2010, the Instant Pot has become a kitchen staple across the United States. There are even people who call themselves potheads, devotees to the device and the pressure cooking way of life. So I was quite shocked to hear that the makers of Instant Pot have filed for bankruptcy. The company that makes Instant Pot and Pyrex glassware has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Instant Pot, Corel Dishes and Pyrex glassware has filed for bankruptcy. And the company that makes Instant Pot slow cookers has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Hello and welcome to my channel. I am the Undefined Blob. And today I'm here to talk to you about the Instant Pot and why, if you were paying attention, their bankruptcy announcement came as no surprise. If you search through any food content today, you are unable to avoid the Instant Pot. People still use them regularly, so much so that we get a new 50 Quick Instant Pot Recipes article once a month. So how can such a loved and ubiquitous product be sold by a company that just filed for bankruptcy? Let me explain. Instant Pots are everywhere. Instant Brands, their maker, claims that over 90% of homes in the United States have an Instant Pot. So clearly, it is a quality product. It does what it says it will, and it's a once every 10 years kind of purchase. Barring any major updates in pressure cooking technology, most people are satisfied with what they have. And the sales data shows that. Now, we don't have specifics from Instant Brands, but based on a report from market research firm NPD Group, sales of electronic multi-cooker devices such as the Instant Pot hit $758 million in 2020. Two years later, it's down nearly 50% to $344 million. After 10 years of growth, the Instant Pot is suffering from its own success. Most people who want one already have one, and those who don't can just get one off Facebook Marketplace for half the price. But selling a good, reliable product is not an immediate death sentence. I mean, Jan Sports are still going strong and still only $60, so it's not impossible. So what happened to Instant Pot? Let's first get an answer from the source. Instant Brands CEO Ben Gadbois blamed high interest rates for the bankruptcy decision, saying, After successfully navigating the COVID-19 pandemic and the global supply chain crisis, we continue to face additional global macroeconomic and geopolitical challenges that have affected our business. In particular, tightening of credit terms and higher interest rates impacted our liquidity levels and made our capital structure unsustainable. Unsustainable capital structure? Again, we don't know the specific sales data for Instant Pot, but those things are everywhere, and clearly the company grew from 2010, their launch, to 2020. A drop in sales should not kill a company so suddenly. Two words, private equity. In 2019, Robert Wang, the creator of the Instant Pot, and other early employees sold the original company to Cornell Capital, a small private equity firm. Wang believed that Cornell would help the Instant Pot grow internationally and into new product lines. They hoped Cornell Capital, which already owned the company that sells Pyrex and Corningware, called Corel Brands, could provide supply chain management and other infrastructure to keep growing, Mr. Wang said. The combined company was valued at more than $2 billion, and it seemed like the beginning of an exciting partnership. When we acquired them, they were the hottest thing in town, said Mike Shefke who worked at Corel in marketing before and after the acquisition. I remember feeling really energized by that. That excitement quickly turned to anxiety as instant brands struggled to keep up with their competitors like Ninja and Honeywell. These companies were dominating old markets and excelling with new technology. I mean, we all know how the air fryer is the it girl of the 2020s. But instant brands tried. They attempted to break into new markets, including an instant air fryer, an instant stand mixer, and even an instant air purifier. 
To do all this, they borrowed money and lots of it. And at the start, that might have been okay. In 2019, interest rates were low and the cash was flowing. Plus, Instant Brands was coasting on their growth, now nine years in the making. But in typical blood-sucking fashion, Cornell Capital did not stop. They took out a loan of $450 million and gave half to shareholders, ruining Instant Brands' credit in the process. It seems the party was coming to an end, and the suits made sure that they got theirs. In the words of Denzel, I'm leaving here with something. <laughs> this snippet of a September 2022 debt wire report sheds more light. In April 2021, Instant Brands issued a new $450 million first lien term loan, in large part to fund about $245 million of dividend distributions to shareholders. As a result, the company's pro forma leverage increased to about eight times following the transaction, from four and a half times for the 12 months ended March 30th, 2021. Since then, its financial sponsors have reinvested about $100 million into the business due to the weaker macroeconomic environment. So Cornell Capital, using Instant Brand's good credit, borrowed $450 million. They used 245 of that to pay back to shareholders, which, hmm, I wonder who holds the most Instant Brand shares. That loan nearly doubles their leverage from four and a half to eight times, so now they have even less assets to cover their debt than before. And in response to the slowing economy, they're all of a sudden like, oh crap, the economy. And so they throw a measly $100 million back into the Instant Brands company. DebtWire continues. Although we acknowledge financial sponsors have reinvested in the company, we do not believe it was their original intention. We believe debt finance shareholder distributions demonstrate financial sponsor appetite for aggressive financial policies. Instant Brands entered a high inflationary and uncertain macroeconomic environment with substantially more debt which left it with a smaller cushion to absorb adverse external events. Basically, that $100 million investment back into the company was not a part of Cornell Capital's original intentions when they borrowed the $450 million. And choosing to pay shareholders with borrowed funds indicates that Cornell Capital was deliberately making aggressive financial moves. Impact on the company be damned. In 2019, when private equity firm Cornell Capital bought Instant Brands, the combined company was valued at more than $2 billion. In June 2023, Instant Brands filed for bankruptcy and claimed just $500 million in assets and liabilities, a 75% decrease in value in just four years. Now, private equity is not new. As we know them, private equity firms have been operating since the 1980s. What is new, to an extent, is how widespread private equity is. It goes beyond Instant Pot or Pyrex. We're talking about entire industries being swallowed up by private equity. Unfortunately, it's time to talk about healthcare. <laughs> Delaware County Memorial Hospital was a hospital in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, a well-known suburb of Philadelphia. Established in 1927, the hospital served the community for nearly 100 years. What happened? You guessed it, private equity. For nearly a century, Delaware County Memorial Hospital in suburban Philadelphia delivered babies, treated trauma, and tended to the critically ill. That all changed earlier this year when its current owner, a Los Angeles-based company called Prospect Medical Holdings, began cutting services. First the maternity ward went, then the operating rooms and the ICU, and then last month, the emergency room closed its doors to the community's nearly 85,000 residents. Delaware Memorial is owned by Crozer Health, a nonprofit Pennsylvania health system. In 2015, Crozer Health oversaw four hospitals and was in danger of failing. Prospect Medical Holdings, backed by private equity investment, acquired the system late that year and promised to revitalize Crozer and the hospitals that they owned. More failures appeared in the company's biggest purchase yet, agreed to in late 2015. The four-hospital Crozer Keystone System in Pennsylvania. Prospect paid $300 million. It made other promises as part of the deal. To spend an additional $200 million in capital improvements within five years. To keep all the hospitals open for a decade. To fund $171 million in pension benefits within five years and to endow a community health care foundation for $53 million. Clearly, that did not happen. Instead, Prospect Medical Holdings followed the private equity playbook to a T. They first took out a nice loan using Crozer's credit, 
a little over $1 billion. They paid themselves handsomely with a dividend to shareholders. Then they sold the land that the hospitals were on and forced the hospitals to lease that land back, saddling them with new monthly expenses. Finally, they aggressively cut operating costs in various ways, including layoffs, and voila, Delaware Memorial was on the road to closure. Mind you, Prospect Medical Holdings owned 20 hospitals in six states by 2018. We are now in 2023, and five of those hospitals are closed, including Delaware Memorial. So much for keeping hospitals open for a decade. And that's just the most recent healthcare closure. How about HCR Manor Care? They went from being the number two operator of nursing homes in the United States to bankruptcy. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Consider the case of the Carlisle Group and the nursing home chain HCR Manor Care. In 2007, Carlisle, a private equity firm now with $373 billion in assets under management, bought HCR Manor Care for a little over $6 billion, most of which was borrowed money that Manor Care, not Carlisle, would have to pay back. As the new owner, Carlisle sold nearly all of Manor Care's real estate and quickly recovered its initial investment. This meant, however, that Manor Care was forced to pay nearly half a billion dollars a year in rent to occupy buildings it once owned. Carlisle also extracted over $80 million in transaction and advisory fees from the company it had just bought, draining Manor Care of money. Manor Care soon instituted various cost-cutting programs and laid off hundreds of workers. Health code violations spiked, and people suffered. The daughter of one resident told the Washington Post that, quote, my mom would call us every day crying when she was in there, and that it was dirty, like a rundown motel, roaches and ants all over the place, unquote. In 2018, Manor Care filed for bankruptcy, with over $7 billion in debt. But that was, in a sense, immaterial to Carlisle, which had already recovered the money it invested and made millions more in fees. We started with something pretty innocuous a kitchen appliance company going broke. So what? But underneath the headlines, the true story is about how private equity has again and again destroyed companies. And it would be fun to immediately say, Yeah, fuck all those corporations. Let them rot. Let them die. Kill them all. But as y'all can see, private equity is touching crucial parts of our lives. It's not just nursing homes and hospitals, as if that wasn't bad enough. Private equity has used their playbook with prison health care, mobile homes, and even apartment buildings. So now what? What can be done to stop, maybe even slow, the scourge of private equity? Now, personally, I could ramble on and on about the free market and how deregulation and the hoarding of capital mean that we cannot get rid of private equity without getting rid of capitalism first, but I'm sure there's a Jacobian article out there somewhere. Instead, let's ask an expert. The really interesting thing about that, and I think what is sort of drew me to this as a lawyer, but also concerns me as a citizen, is that because of the layered ownership structure of private equity firms, oftentimes private equity firms have control of the companies they buy, but very little responsibility when, the, when those companies do um, arguably illegal things. That is Brendan Ballou a federal prosecutor who has served as special counsel for private equity in the antitrust division at the Department of Justice. He's also the author of Plunder, Private Equity's Plan to Pillage America. He was recently on the Verge's Decoder podcast speaking about the way that private equity has been operating over the past 40 years. If you're interested in this stuff, I highly recommend listening to the entire podcast or even reading the interview. Baloo gets into a lot, including how private equity firms target working class people, no surprise, and also how private equity firms are able to avoid public scrutiny so well, as opposed to pharmaceutical companies, for example. But I wanted to focus on the part where Baloo offers us solutions, because I go to the hospital, I live in an apartment building, and I liked the Instant Pot. And also, as depressing as this topic can be, it's important that we find motivation to do some sort of action. So, Brendan, what can we do? The other thing we need to do is just empower uh, the activist community here so that they can keep doing this work of both educating people and pushing elected officials and people in government. So there are a number of organizations out there, the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, Americans for Financial Reform, American Economic Liberties Project, to name just 
three of several. Empowering those groups to really help build a grassroots movement is going to be really important here. Because I, I want to be clear, this is not a thing that we're going to solve in 18 or 24 months. You know, this is the work of a generation to fix a flawed business model, just as it was the work of a generation to constrain the trust. But if we did it once, we can potentially do it again. And that's just the beginning. Baloo goes on to describe ways that people have already fought back against private equity and won. Now, can that be done? I have to say, I am really encouraged by what's happening um, around private equity in specific industries. You know, I just mentioned prison phone services where, where PE has been very active. There have been a number of activist organizations that have had extraordinary success in limiting the rates that need to be paid by prisoners to make phone calls. At one point, it was as high as $25 for a 15-minute call. This is, le- this is activism that was happening at the local, state, and now the federal level. In fact, le- legislation was just passed in Congress last year to address this. Similar movements are happening around nursing homes. And so I, I think often there can be real movement on this if you focus on a specific issue or a specific industry. And I think that because we've seen it happen. Pyrex, Toys R Us, Twitter. These are just a few of private equity's latest victims. But the fight is just beginning, so don't lose hope just yet. And that brings us to the end of the video. If you liked what you saw, please leave a like. I mentioned a lot of industries, so leave a comment of where you've seen private equity at work. I'm really interested in knowing what you guys think about this, so please leave a comment. If you'd like to see another video, subscribe. It's free, and it lets me know that you guys want to see more. Undefined Blob, signing out. Peace.